Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Daniela Bleichmar. I am a professor of art history and history at USC and the director of the Levan Institute for the Humanities. Uh, today, we are hosting a book chat to uh, celebrate and recognize and discuss this new book, Natives. We. Oui. You cannot see it, but oh well. Natives Against Nativism is not blurry in the actual book. Thank you, Olivia. Natives Against Nativism, Anti-Racism and Indigenous Critique in Postcolonial France, uh, published by the University of Minnesota Press 2023. And the author, Olivia Harrison, is Associate Professor of French and Italian, Comparative Literature, Middle East Studies, and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. Uh, Olivia has selected as her interlocutors for these conversations, uh, Cecile Alduy, who is Professor of French and Italian at Stanford University, and Abdelali Hajat, who is Associate Professor of Sociology at the Free University of Brussels. And today's conversation will be moderated by Hajar Yaziha, who is Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Southern California. Today's book chat is a collaboration between the Levan Institute for the Humanities and the USC Equity Research Institute, the USC Francophone Research and Resource Center, and the USC Max Cade Institute for Austrian-German Swiss Studies. Um, the format for uh, our time together is very simple. Professor Harrison will discuss her book briefly, and then she will engage in conversation with professors Aldui and Hajat for about 30 minutes. And then in the last 15 or so minutes of the hour, she will answer questions from the audience. Um, I want to emphasize that this event is an opportunity for us to engage with and celebrate Olivia's new book. And in that spirit, I hope that we will be focusing our conversation around the ideas at the center of the book, and of course, as always in scholarly settings, but especially given the events that are currently unfolding, uh, to be sure that our discussion remains within the norms of civil discourse. So Olivia, many congratulations on your book and please tell us about it. Uh, can you unmute? Thank you, now I can, thank you. <laughs> I don't know, I couldn't do it before. Um, thank you so much, Daniela, for making this possible, having this book series. And I want to also thank Isabella Carr for all the help in making everything possible and the whole team. Um, and of course, Ed, Delali, Cecile, and Hej for uh, being my interlocutors today and everybody for being here. It's really wonderful to see friends and colleagues, um, even though I can't necessarily see you all yet. Um, and I, uh, I have to say I'm especially grateful for this opportunity to speak about my book and also to speak about Palestine, because of course my book is, is also a book about the Palestinian question at this moment when speech surrounding Palestine is undergoing various forms of interdiction here in the US, but also in France, which is the focus of the book, um, and also in other parts of Europe, like Germany. And I was just talking to a student from Vietnam who was telling me that in Vietnam, it's not possible to demonstrate for Palestine and so forth. So I'm very um, grateful for the, for as you say, the space to have an actual conversation um, uh, in a context where events are being canceled, um, including our colleague uh, Viet Huen's talk uh, uh, at the New York City Y and so forth. And, you know, I think, you know, we can talk about um, the impact that that has on our uh, intellectual work, uh, of course, and, and it does have an impact, right? The climate currently has a has a, an impact, especially on, you know, people who are not tenured, so students, contingent faculty, and so forth. Um, but there are also maybe more sinister consequences as well. And so I was just, um, I wanted to bring up, for example, in the French context, the arrest of a um, of a uh, feminist militant from Gaza, uh, Maria Maboudaka. So I just read that the Paris Tribunal uh, reversed her arrest. She was under house arrest. She was going to be expulsed um, and returned to to Gaza. Um, that's been reversed. I'm not sure what she's doing right now. But so we're talking about sort of real, also real kind of geopolitical consequences for anybody um, who uh, who is uh, invested 
in what's happening in Gaza right now. And I think that the, so I'm kind of beginning with a preamble because I think it's important to situate actually the research that I do and that I'm bringing forward in this book because the, this particular example of Maria Mabudaka's arrest um, and, uh, and which has just been reversed um, is in the context in France of um, a proposed law that would make it uh, even easier to expel uh, uh, immigrants from France on the grounds now of quote unquote behavior you're not compatible with French values, end quote. So this is very interesting to me. The law has not been passed yet, um, uh, but it's, it's extremely interesting because in this sense, being pro-Palestinian in France is being presented or framed as being incompatible with French values, with the values of the French Republic. Somewhat paradoxically, she's a feminist, unveiled, I should say, feminist uh, activist. So um, that's a bit of a jump. But I think the conclusion that we can draw from that is that still today to be pro-Palestinian in France is in fact to be somehow uh, dangerous, right? Um, and to be associated with potential, potentially uh, uh, terrorism. Um, so without conflating, you know, the, the kind of urgency, the gravity of what's happening right now, with this kind of longer 50 year history that I look at in the book, um, I think it's important to, to, to draw those connections. Uh, and as Abdel Ali Hajat, who's, who's worked on and published on this uh, knows, in the early 1970s, which is where the book begins, migrants, immigrants to France were being expulsed and sent back to their home countries because they were pro-Palestinian. So, you know, there seems to be um, a, a history that needs to be told here. And so that's partly what the book is trying to do. It's partly an attempt to historicize, historicize anti-colonial solidarity with Palestine, and also to explore what the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Adwish calls Palestine as metaphor, uh, which uh, has, uh, you know, resonance well outside of the vanishing borders of Palestine. So in the book, I focus on the intersection of pro-Palestinian activism and the migrant rights movement in France from the early 1970s all the way up to the present. And it's a story that continues. Um, and I have a very wide ranging corpus. So just to say a few things to give the, the audience an idea of the, the text that I, that I look at. Um, uh, I look at the ephemeral publications of the Palestine Committees, the Comité de Soutien à la Révolution Palestinienne, uh, which Abdel Ali Hajat has worked on um, and, and opened that door for us to, to work on this, on this topic. Um, and the Arab Workers Movement, the Mouvement des Travailleurs Arabes, uh, which uh, was uh, came out of that movement uh, for, uh, for Palestinian uh, rights in France, which was also a movement for migrant rights, and it's really the beginning of the migrant rights and the undocumented uh, migrant rights movement in France. I look at novels and plays that were written by the children and grandchildren of North African immigrants to France, so-called Beur and Banlieue literature from the 1980s to the present. Um, I have a chapter on Jean Genet's Palestinian writings and also his writings about migrants, which are less well known. Uh, Jean-Luc Godard's Palestinian films and also the figure of the Native American in his, in his films. And finally, contemporary novels and artworks that make the link between the so-called migrant crisis in which we are still living and the Palestinian questions to historicize the migrant question. Um, in, in relation to, to Palestine. So what I show or what I'm trying to do but through all these case studies is to, is to re reveal the ways in which Palestine really has been central to the migrant rights and anti-racist movement in France for the past half century. Uh, the text that I study articulate what I'm calling indigenous critique, and it's a term that I'm sure we'll, we'll have a chance to talk to talk about more, um, uh, for uh, basically to reactivate anti-colonial critique in the present that we too quickly call post-colonial. Of course, in relation to Palestine, also in relation to the question of indigeneity, actually. And so I look at the twin figures of the Palestinian and the American Indian, or the, the Landian uh, in French, in uh, this anti-racist literature. Um, and the and so what I'm trying to do as well, and this is a, I think um, has uh, has urgency in the French context, but I think uh, can be thought about in similar terms in the U.S. context context is to historicize anti-racism, right, as something that actually uh, has a history, uh, a long history, complex history, and it's not you know it didn't just fall from the sky um, and to uh, and to think about what activists in France have called the, col the colonial continuum, le continuum colonial. Uh, Anti-racism was not invented or imported from the US. This is something that is frequently said in France, uh, in French public discourse. Uh, and so the book is also trying to show that there's a longstanding 
French history of anti-racism in which Palestine plays a central role. And so here I'm really going against the grain of the ubiquitous notion that Palestine is a cause that is foreign to France, right? That it's an imported conflict um, and that it matters only to Arabs or to Muslims. And there's a lot of slippage between those terms, as we know, um, and to the far left, the radical left. Um, so recently, one of the terms that's been deployed is the term islamo-gauchisme. I always slip up because it used to be islamo-fascisme. So islamo-leftism, which is an intentionally mystificatory term uh, that kind of makes this connection between, uh, uh, actually that was that was coined by uh, Pierre-André Taguieff precisely in order to amalgamate anti-Zionism in the sense of anti-colonial uh, critique and, uh, and pro-Palestinianism, right? So uh, the phrase is a, is a kind of portmanteau to, to designate that, but has now been used more largely to talk about um, you know, the, this kind of ill-defined uh, alliance between the Muslim or Islamist uh, uh, parties and the left. Uh, so Palestine fun kind of functions as a litmus test for, you know, are you or are you not <laughs> an Islamo-leftist? Um, but I'm actually also reading Palestine in the sense of pro-Palestinianism pro-Palestinianism as a, as a reverse litmus test for Frenchness and for indigeneity. And so part of what I realized in writing this book in this really fraught, increase, increasingly fraught context, both here and, and in the U.S. actually, um, was that I would have to contend also with what I'm calling the appropriation or the recuperation of indigeneity as uh, the grounds for nativist articulations of Frenchness and in particular for anti-immigrant discourse, right? Uh, so coming back to kind of that first point that I make, if you're in a way, if you're pro-Palestinian, then you're not really French, right? There's a, a problem of identity there. So one of the thinkers that has been really uh, important for me in thinking about the politicization of indigeneity uh, in the post-colonial context is Mahmoud Mamdani, uh, who uses, so this is a phrase I borrow from Mahmoud Mamdani, the politicization of indigeneity. He's focusing in his work on uh, the politici politicization of indigeneity in the post-colonial nation state. Um, and for him, indigeneity is invented through colonial rule. And I'm interested in the politicization of indigeneity in, in you could say, in the post-colonial metropole, right, in the, uh, um, in the context of, of France in particular. And I want to just conclude um, my kind of opening remarks here um, by, so so on the one hand, I have the through line that is really the through line about the intersection of anti-racism and pro-Palestinianism pro in France. But as I mentioned, I also uh, contend with, uh, so the figure of Palestine, but also the figure of the, of the American Indian um, in this literature and the appropriation of indigeneity in nativist discourse. And so that was in a way the uh, kind of what I was trying to draw attention to in the title itself, um, and uh, and I just wanted to to conclude by my re opening remarks by um, drawing your attention to the cover. Uh, even though Palestine is not in the title, it is on the cover in the cover image, and so I wanted to show you what the cover image actually is, um, because it's 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 just an excerpt uh, on the cover of the book, and this is um, the logo of the Mouvement des Travailleurs Arabes, or one of their logos from the uh, probably mid 1970s. Um, which uh, is in the shape of Palestine. So you can see here the the, the worker raising uh, his fist and he's shrouded in uh, something that it could be a kufaya Palestinian headscarf. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that as a way also to open the discussion, maybe of the place of Palestine in the book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Olivia. And again, congratulations. This is just such a powerful and important book. So we're, we're all very grateful to you. Um, I would love to first invite Cecile to offer some comments and questions and then really open it up to the interlocutors and Olivia to have uh, what I think will be a very interesting conversation and you know, much less formal than a kind of proper interview, much more kind of generative. Uh, so, so Cecile, please take it away. Thank you. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to discuss this book. It was really a pleasure to read it. It was fascinating. I really devoured it. Um, as you can imagine, um, the there are specific topics that were specifically salient to me as a scholar of the far right and far right discourse, which was something I had already noticed. But you brought even more material to you know on my side of uh, the scholarly 
uh, field, which is the inversion of anti-racist discourse and, and the appropriation of um, in, um, indigeneity and uh, anti-racist and even anti-colonial discourse by the far right in order to dismiss um, not only migrants, but generations of um, uh, families of migrants from France and disqualify them from French identity. So I'll come back to that, but I just wanted to highlight for the audience, um, you know, a few, uh, some of the qualities that I really appreciated in your book, and, and I hope it's useful for you as well. I think the uh, one of the most exciting thing that you're doing is to bring this critical lens to the vocabulary that has been used both by scholars um, in the political conversation and by uh, specific groups, whether they are anti-racist uh, movements or the opposite side of the spectrum uh, around this idea of um, the connection between um, place and identity. And um, this is so crucial, of course, today uh, a people and the land, and um, you know maybe it will echo in in what's currently going on, of course. Uh, but this idea that um, there's a right place for some people to be, and conversely, some places uh, some people should be excluded from inhabiting some places. Um, I think we could have an anthropological discussion of where this idea, you know. <laughs> Uh, in the course of humanity has emerged, but it has been historicized, as you mentioned, and politicized um, through colonization and beyond. And now we are at a turn of history, which is ironic in the sense that um, the entire colonial movement was um, an assertion that uh, both displacing and populating uh, other territories with appropriate, legitimate, in the name of um, grand uh, humanistic values. Uh, of course, the economic considerations were not as explicit, uh, at least for the public, but very, very much present. And now that decolonization has happened, at least in terms of um, the uh, division of uh, state nations across the world, and of course, with the exceptions that are, are present in the current situation in Gaza, um, this same colonial discourse has been uh, inversed and um, nativists, and we could call them white supremacists in different location in Europe and the United States are now using anti-colonial vocabulary and the idea that the colonization is bad basically uh, to prevent people from entering their borders and claim the very thing that they denied other, which is uh, that a land could belong to a people. And we could discuss whether that idea that the land be belongs to a people is one of the sources of many problems or something that can be at fault. Um, but I would like to you to uh, continue to reflect on a few things. Um, I found this critique that you're offering, which really tries to um, put a little distance um, between the scholar and therefore the reader and the, the different um, organizations and actors that you study on all sides to kind of um, develop the consequences of the usage of a certain vocabulary um, I, I really appreciated that because I think that we are at a crucial political moment where uh, the public conversation has been so confused, uh, has been so instrumentalized, and is um, so devoid of historical knowledge also. And I think this is where the your book as an intervention is so crucial. And I wish French politicians would read it, just even just know their own history. Um, but a lot of vocabulary circulated that is taken at face value when it's loaded with so much history. And I like you, I'm going to take examples and then I love you to guide us in a way in how to engage in a meaningful, nuanced conversation today when this vocabulary has been almost uh, voided of any 
uh, historical meaning. So for instance, uh, you take the example of um, the word um, indigène, uh, indigenous as um, having been first uh, a term uh, um, imposed onto the native people of, um, of the territories that were colonized by the French empire. So the code de l'indigène. So it was both um, a stigma and a mark to um, establish a two-tier uh, nation with an entire population with no right, uh, the indigène, was tremendous amount of cultural stigma as well. And this term has circulated back and being reinvested by anti-racist uh, activists, um, pretty late in history when you think of it, uh, you know, like just 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, to reclaim uh, the complexity of their origins and of uh, why they are where they are today and why they are excluded to from where they are today. So uh, those movements reclaim the word indigène to say, we are born here, meaning in metropolis, France, but we are also coming from uh, the people who were labeled indigène in Algeria, in Morocco, in Senegal. And so the word in their uh, public speeches and in films like the, the film Indigène is, is extremely rich and layered and is an affirmation of this complexity and demand for the rights of being a native where they are. But now the same word is being used by the very old far right movement which has never ceased to claim always the same thing, which is only French by root. Um, in the 1930s, they would have said French by race, because it was still a word that could be used in France, um, have legitimacy to be truly French and inhabit France. And so the word indigène has been used by people like uh, Renaud Camus and others uh, to, um, shift the stigma and victimize themselves as the one who are, are being colonized today with a complete erasure of what colonization means in the word colonized. Um, and of course, you know, I, I, as you know, I've, I've studied in Zemmour a lot and just this word colonization has been completely drawn from any substance to just mean the presence of others on our land, basically. However, and so we can see through you and me and people in the room, I imagine. However, in the public conversation, in political debates today in France, you have sometimes uh, well-meaning, in good faith, um, citizens, scholars, people who, who say, well, in a way, you know, the anti racists brought race to the foreground. They are the ones who are using race as a word, who are using white to describe people. And now it's even compounded by the current uh, impasse around defining what anti Semitism is, what anti Zionism is, uh, what anti racism is. So how do we do today? I mean, this is my question, but you can turn it any direction. What? How do we do today? And how? What? How helpful would be a critique of this vocabulary and its history to um, to salvage, in a way, the uh, decolonial project and the anti-racist uh, principles? while not feeding um, a public conversation that turns it upside down to stigmatize them and point um, back racism at them. And I hope my question is not too, you know, flipping around several times. No, thank you so much. And actually, I think what you, the way you described the, 
inversion of the term antigen is probably very useful for, for those in the room who are less familiar with these strategies of rétorsion, as actually as Tagiev used to call it before he did it himself. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so that's that's really useful, and I and I think your 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 kind of quick overview of that is exactly correct. You know, I, I I completely agree with with the way that you describe it. Um, the question of how to how to counter that, I think, is extremely important. And I'll start by saying that I, I don't think anybody who would need to read this book will read it. You know, it's, it's a self-selected crowd of people probably who will read it. But in a small way, I think continuing to insist on these histories, right, continuing to read Fanon well against de Benoit, Alain de Benoit or Renaud Camus reading Fanon badly, right, quoting out of context, et cetera, I think we need to insist on this uh, this long history of anti-colonial, anti-racist thought, and so of course we can do this as we do in the university, in our in our courses. We can do this as we do in in our publications, but of course that's still a very tiny, tiny, tiny readership. And then we can do it as as you do, I know, um, in in uh, for for a larger public. And I think that 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 work that work is extremely important. And in a way, we have to just outsmart uh, the you know uh, kind of explain what's happening and also explain it in simple terms that are easy to follow. Well, actually, where does this term come from? And what does it mean to use it in this way, right? And indigène, maybe to just add one thing, it's funny, indigéniste is now used as to, as a, almost as a synonym for wokeist, for like woke, right? Um, sometimes, but then it's also, indigène is also appropriated as signifying, you know, white ethno-racial Frenchness. Um, so, so, you know, this is maybe a little old fashioned or naive of me, but I think it's extremely important to continue doing that philological historical work on these terms that are being instrumentalized. And also to historicize, as I was saying, anti-racism itself, right? Because part of that conversation that you're referring to of like, oh, that's, and now it's like wokeism, right? So the term woke has entered the vocabulary or, you know, it, and of course there's a whole uh, a whole side gig on the gender theory um, because that's also problematic, uh, critical race theory, all these things in France, they, they, they just basically are, have been saying for years, way before these terms were even terms in the English language, they've been saying it's all coming from the US. Right, it's all extremely new, uh, and and the, and that's been very powerful. It's worked extremely well to completely dehistoricize and erase uh, these really complex histories. So again, I have no illusions about <laughs> who would read this book, um, but I think that in in small ways, you know, we can uh, sort of plant seeds for then other people to take this. And I think also, like you know, you're you're referring, of course, to les indigènes de la République. The, and I, I tend to actually translate indigène as natives to kind of um, convey the colonial legal framework of that term and the, even the, the racist framework of that, the connotation of the term. Um, so natives against natives of the Republic, for example. And you're right, they're also claiming indigeneity to France. Um, but but I think they're precisely and here they don't they don't even really explain it that much. I mean, they explain it a little bit, but they're using the term in this different way that displaces that that reappropriation of indigeneity. And I think that, you know, I don't know how that, how they strategize that or, or articulate on that, but that's the effect of it. I think the effect of it is very powerful. And that's why they've been so controversial um, in France, uh, uh, I think. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there because I know we're, we have very little time and I want to make sure that Abdelali Hajat can speak as well. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to add something about the uh, the concept of indigenous critique, because your uh, book shows very well how indigeneity became a major issue, both for anti-racists and for racist movements. And it's quite quite striking when I when I read uh, your book uh, that uh, it's it was so important for two opposite sides. Because on one side, you have this uh, anti-racist indigenous critique, which uh, claim we are here because you were there. Or we are here in the post-colonial France because you were there in the, in the colonial empire. And there was a definition of indigeneity based on the colonial legacy uh, in the post-colonial France. So that's in the one side. On the other side, there is this uh, far right polemicist such, such as uh, Alain de Benoit or Alain Soral, who define themselves as a white minority, 
and they claim that we left Algeria, so you have to leave France. So it's a, another definition of indigeneity, uh, not based on history, but on blood, on this inversion of the relations between colonizer and colonized, uh, since they pretend to be colonized by post-colonial migrants. So this uh, rhetoric of uh, in, uh, inversion, so when we, uh, I, I don't know if you, uh, if you are aware, if you are aware of the, the book uh, written by Albert Ishman on the uh, rhetoric of reaction. I think it's a, a typical case of uh, inversion uh, uh, made by reactionary discourse. So uh, I think that's the main issue. Uh, in this uh, in these debates uh, in the postcolonial France, so I'm I'm very grateful that you uh, you put the finger on this uh, very important issue, and I have a question uh, about this concept of indigenous critique, um, and I ask this question because I read uh, uh, Edouard Say's book, C Culture and Imperialism. And uh, he make a distinction between two kinds of uh, anti-colonial discourse, what he called this kind of uh, radical humanism. Uh, and he referred to uh, Franz Fanon, to Wole Soyinka, et cetera. And he also used the term nativism, indigenous nativism. And he's, it's related to the concept of negritude uh, forged by uh, Leopold Seda Sanger. So my question is, uh, is there only one indigenous critique? Couldn't we say that there are an essentialist way to define uh, an anti-colonial discourse? And, uh, and, is, and this issue of essentialism, uh, did, did you find it in, in your book and how can you deal with it? That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um... And thank you for the reminding me of uh, the distinction Said makes in that book. Uh, I'll, I'll have to go back to it. I, I'm, I'm familiar with it in Said's work in general and his critique of essentialism and his critique of nationalism, especially, mm. um, which is what secular humanism means for him. It's a critique of nationalism and, and the um, mm. identitarian discourses and the production of minorities, et cetera. So that, you know, uh, mm. I have, so I have to say maybe uh, to kind of step back, and this is related to what Cecile was saying um, when you were talking about the kind of pitfalls maybe of thinking of, of a ownership of land, right, or of a kind of um, a essential propriety, propri propriety of land or mm -hmm. connection to land, right? Because, of course, we know. So the first thing that I should say before I move on is that, of course, the term indigenous, indigène in all of its uh, translations, right, uh, is a is a it's a Latin term. It's a Latin mm. term based on genus, which which has been variously understood throughout the ages as people or race or et cetera, right? So it, it, it's part of the product, the modern Eurocolonial modern production of racial thinking, actually. And and so the term itself, of course, originates in the colonial encounter. We know this, right? Mm. Um, th this is not the term for various people as they call themselves. And so it becomes a political identity. And that's the that's the emphasis that I'm putting on it as a political identity that is born out of the colonial encounter. And in all of the texts that I look at, so whether it's the CSRP, the MTA, uh, Mohamed Rouabi, Jeunet, of course, anti-identitarian, uh, you can't go more anti-identitarian than Jeunet. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, with Godard, it's maybe more ambiguous, but in general, I am drawn to the texts that are precisely trying to dismantle and to undermine uh, the kind of naturalization of any identity, really. And so that is in, that is in, in, in tension, let's say, with uh, various forms of, of course, nationalist discourse or discourses of national sovereignty, of course, um, and of course, also with indigenous rights, right? Indigenous rights that are now inscribed within the UN, uh, within the United U UN Charter, but uh, of the attachments of a particular people to a particular land. So I'm kind of circling back to to Cecile's point here, and you know, at the risk of um, of sounding just too deconstructivist, but I, I think that there's a there's a real political stake. There's a real political stake in in uh, insisting on the political as opposed to identitarian, on the political as opposed to the kind of naturalized 
relation, mm. right? Uh, mm. uh, or indigeneity as a political identity that is one mm. of resistance. Um, mm. And so, and so there, there is, and I, and I, I try to talk about this in the book a little bit. There is a tension mm. between my articulation of what I'm calling indigenous critique and mm. indigenous studies, actually, right? Mm. Or um, or uh, uh, the idea of you know of political sovereignty, and you know I think that there's a lot to be to be gained from rethinking attachment to land through indigenous understandings of that that are in fact very different from uh, you know Euro colonial understandings of of taking possession of etc. So mm. that's in a way it's I didn't have space or or maybe you know maybe I, I maybe I should go there maybe I should go there at some point because I think that there could be really mm. interesting points of um uh po points of also of political opportunity there but um but and actually it, this is also extremely relevant in the context of Israel Palestine of course right mm. the question of of political sovereignty the relation to the lands the the mm. question of return right um mm. uh and and I think some of the some of the most kind of bold, some of the boldest revolutionary proposals have been also to to try to uh, to uh, unroot the relationship of the land to a particular people to a particular right. Yeah. Again, Mahmoud Manzani's recent arguments on disconnecting the nation and the state. Right, um, mm -hmm. a state should be a state not just for one nation, right? It should be a state for mm. all of its citizens. And that's also the insistence there on citizenship, which is a through line, right? Because precisely as Cecilia was mentioning, that bifurcation between nationality and citizenship, which is so specific to the French imperial context and then is articulated in a different way in Israel-Palestine as well, right? Mm. Where um, where Jews are nationals, uh, but non-Jews are not nationals, even if they are citizens. There's a kind of interesting, mm. um, almost reversal of, of, of what, obtained in the French Empire. But so all this to say that I, I completely uh, I, I, I take your I take your mm -hmm. your point of critique and and mm -hmm. and I think that it's something that again I think is really important to insist on. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, again in in terms that would be legible, right? Like I think that there's also a, a real like in, without sounding like a deconstructivist, like how can we make those arguments and show mm -hmm. that the stakes are extremely important, right? Like how could we rethink citizenship uh, mm. differently? This is great. Yeah. Um, we have such little time left, which really bums me out because this is such a rich conversation. Um, I want to offer both Cecile and Abdelali uh, the opportunity to just kind of pitch one more question, maybe in conjunction, um, and then Olivia, feel free to close us out. Okay. Before we go to Q&A, that is. Yeah, well, I have a question, but it's a big one, and, and maybe it's just a, a question like food for thought, because uh, really what Abdelali just said, it really resonated with me, because sometimes, you know, my only tiny little critique of your book is that you could be even more critical of all kinds of discourses, and I think that um, maybe there would be, you know, follow-up, you know, article or research project uh, going into more detail in, of, of specific uh, emanation from this anti-racist uh, history that you trace that have gone way towards the essentialist notion um, of, you know, uh, defending um, minorities. So for instance, and, and you allude to them, I, I think it would be really great to have a clarification of actual very simple trends uh, such as what constitutes racism today, you know, or, or do we have to qualify with today? Because you have actors, I mean, actors in the sense of like people who are agent in the public discourse, such as uh, Diodone, uh, who's, who at some point was just like completely legitimate anti-racist guy and has, has weirded off into a very, very different direction. So, but how, how can we, you know, pedagogically explain why he is in a different conception of race, which is not a critical theory, you know, definition of voice as something that is imposed upon specific groups, but something that he claims for himself as coming from his roots and his skin color, and that he sees in other people's skin color. And people like Boutelja, you know, which is a borderline case where it's, we would have to go text by text, probably. Um, and on the opposite end, you have Jean Genet. And I think maybe Jean Genet would be the great solution to our uh, quandaries because 
um, his evocation of the notion of love and um, as the root of his aspiration to become Palestinian by, you know, in heart almost. I mean, as you explained, the minute um, a Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian cause would become a state that would enforce law and order, you'd be out. And I mm. think it's it's extremely telling of the inspirational value of the uh, Palestinian metaphor, or the Palestinian myth, or um, or how it draws people in. And the minute the concept of identity is reified into enforcing strict boundaries uh, and law and order, maybe we lose um, the foundations of what made the movement um, important universally, right? So I, I guess I don't have a question except what is racism, which is really way too big. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that there's, I, I mean, the quality of your book is that there's so much more to continue to think about after we've closed, uh, we've closed it. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah, I don't know. My webcam uh, shut down, but I'm, I'm always here. I'm still here. Uh, I guess a very short question about the concept of transcolonial or trans um, indigenous identification. I think it's the other very important concept uh, of your book. And um, I'm wondering uh, why Palestine is so important. It's a simple question, and uh, because there are other um, colonial, anti-colonial situation, even in the French Empire, you, take, you, take, you can take talk about the uh, New Caledonia, like, like Anaki, uh, which could be considered as a colonial situation. Uh, the, uh, the Caribbeans also, they are the... Um, the post-colonial migrants didn't really identify to the uh, Caribbean movements. So yeah, uh, that's, I'm wondering why they, there is this centrality of Palestine in these kind of movements. Thank you both. Um, I think, I wonder if we should take a few questions from the audience and then I, and then maybe I can tie some questions together because as Cecile said, in fact, they're both huge questions that I've been trying to uh, uh, answer for two decades at this point. So so yeah, how, how should we take a few questions? Absolutely, yes. Audience members, please feel free to raise your hand and I will unmute you. And actually I can I can start I can start while questions are, are coming through. Um uh and it's there's no way that I can do justice to either of these really important questions. Um except to say that we might disagree a little bit, Cecile. So for me, Boutelja and Yodonne are worlds apart. Um, and Dieudonné is now doing the same kinds of inversions of discourse that we were discussing before. So he's just gone straight straight to the right, in my opinion. Um, and I, I, f I don't know that it's going to be useful to define race or racism at this point, honestly. Uh, I think in a certain sense, uh, that's part of the problem, right? Is there, It's this kind of like, well, you know, either we do need to define it or we don't need to define it, or should we take it out of the constitution or not? <laughs> you know, is it doing more harm than good? Um, and and to, it, to my mind, that those are all kind of dead ends. Um, I think we need to talk about very specific questions like migrant rights, like citizenship, you know, that's that's where I think the work, the work can be done. Um, and then in terms of why Palestine, unless there are questions that have come in, but feel free to interrupt me, Hej. Um, yeah, so the, my first book was on the Palestinian question in North Africa, and uh, and, and and also why was it so important for um, uh, Moroccans, Algerians, Tunisians after independence? You know, the, the kind of obvious answer is, well, it's the Middle East, it's the Arab world, it's the Arabic speaking world, it's the Muslim majority world. And actually, the Palestinian question is very important in the much, much, much larger uh, Muslim majority world, I should add. It's not, it's, you know, so there's a, there's a kind of 
uh, tendency to narrow the scope to just the Arabic speaking world. It's much, it's much bigger than that, but it's also bigger than that too, right? So how, so how many concentric circles, like really you can go also to indigenous rights movements in the US uh, who are also very invested in Palestine, uh, you know, South Africa and Palestine, Vietnam, Vietnam and Palestine. There are so many connections uh, specifically to the Palestinian question. And I think here for me, someone like Edward Said is really crucial in understanding, you know, the centrality, the continued importance, even though unfortunately he's not with us anymore to, to shed light on what's happening right now, for example. But, um, you know, Ella Shohad and others who, who have written about this, one of the you know, in, in my first book, I, I was thinking about the importance of the Palestinian question for understanding uh, uh, actually the question of um, of sovereignty, of political sovereignty, um, uh, and 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 so, and I think that that's 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 a big part of it. Um, uh, but of course, Hannah Arendt's uh, insights also into the the question of minorities. Um, uh, so it seems it seems like a a, a juncture point of so many different kind of questions of of, of your colonial modernity um and and even just of of nationalism right uh so that's that would be a a very like overly vague attempt <laughs> to answer that question i think in france so there is a i think there is a more specific answer for france because of course france with britain was uh was uh was absolutely part of the production of the Palestinian question, right? Uh, France played a, a major role at that time in uh, in setting the course, right, for for the the century uh, for the century to come. So I think that there is a specific French imperial historicity of Palestine that makes it particularly important for understanding both French imperialism and what has happened since, let's say, 1962. And of course, that continues, as you say, with uh, uh, France's "Quote unquote overseas possessions today, right, and the kind of bifurcated citizenship that we have in in uh, in different parts of 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 France's empire." Um, from the audience, uh, Daniela has a question. Thank you. I am so. This is so far from my expertise, but if there are no experts with raised hands, um, uh, uh, I wanted to ask something in in light of Abdelali's uh, last question because. Um, Part of what was fascinating to me, I, I work, I'm a colonial Latin Americanist. I, I work on currently a, a book on Mexico in the 16th uh, century. So questions of, of who, um, uh, or how to say, there the question of who is indigenous and what that means and what role that has over time. And then for the modern nation state are extremely different. But for me, something that was very uh, interesting and surprising about uh, the book is uh, the fear of the indigenous American uh, and how that fear uh, um, is becomes uh, part of this anti-racist uh, uh, activism. Uh, in part, it surprised me as somebody who is not an expert on, on France, uh, because as, as Adelie was saying, um, France has both like post-colonial relationships to American, indigenous Americans in other regions, right? And in, in the Caribbean. Um, so I was, um, it almost felt like a sublimation or a obfuscation of something to, to focus on the indigenous American from the US movies rather than on indigenous Americans that are uh, 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 connected to France through post-colonial uh, um, so I just wanted to hear you say more about that because it seemed a place where like visual culture just took something off in a different direction. Uh, and I wanted to hear why. No, this is great. And I think we should talk because I, I need to go back actually to, um, to France's first colonial empire. Um, so even before the Caribbean in what's now Quebec, right, in, in Canada uh, uh, and Louisiana. New France. Um, exactly, New France, exactly. So this is something that is um, very much uh, uh, on the cards, for, for, on the table for me, because I, ne I, I, I need to understand the emergence of this figure of the Indian, because of course, as you know, that was the first term that was used, Indio, right? Anza. Uh, so I, I, so that's that's something I want to do. Um, I, I think it's interesting. So the, the, this idea of sublimation is is interesting, or of a kind of um, uh, forgetting, like a willful forgetting, a disregard for the the Indians that we actually 
had, right, that we actually ruled over, you know, the, our first indigène before that, the term indigène was really being used. And that's something I also have to go back to the archive and see were they already using ind population indigène at the time. Um, I don't think so. Uh, so you see this in, in the literature from Montaigne. Of course, he was writing about the, the Huguenot uh, colonies in, uh, with, uh, who were in uh, Brazil around uh, Rio with the Tupinamba. Um, that's in what, like 1501 or something. Um, but then of course, in the actual colonies, which were also, by the way, settlement colonies. And that's something too that I need to understand better is the place of settlement um, uh, uh, in the production of nativism. So this would be a 500 year plus history. Uh, what is the what is the what is the even Im imaginary uh, uh, I don't want to psychologize it, but what is even the kind of imagination right of population replacement happening from those very early settler colonies? Uh, again, before we even had the, the the idea of a settler colony, but there were settlers there, right? Um, and in fact, this is something I've been thinking about in, in in a course I'm teaching on translating race. The very term colonisation in French, or the term coloniser, includes settlements because the colon is the one who settles. It's the settler. It's not the colonist, the colonizer, et cetera, it's the settler, right? So I think that there's something really cardinal in settlement as a population, as a project of population replacement, displacement, genocide, et cetera, as we know, different forms that that takes, right? But replacing one population with another, basically. Um, and so uh, th this comes back in fantasies of great replacement, of course, but um, but I think that there are many other places too where, where there, so so I, I think I, I think I, I, I would go to where you're going to. There's a sort of erasure of that figure, um, but also an exoticization of that figure. Uh, and then a sort of almost uh, romanticization, of course, you know, throughout the Enlightenment, as we know, right? And and in that, and actually my my advisor, Madeline Doby from Columbia, wrote a book about uh, precisely the figure of the Black slave and the figure of the Indian in French uh, early modern, well, more um, uh, 18th century literature. So. Um, these are questions that I'm, I'm very much grappling with. So thank you for that for that suggestion. Great, we have a question from Matthew. Matthew, let me unmute you. There you go. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Olivia, thank you so much for this book uh, and for everyone for being on this panel. Um, I'm glad actually, Danielle, that you asked that question. But let me uh, authorize my question because I was going to commit the sin of asking you to talk about something that's not really directly in the book. But um, the book sparked so many questions um, historically. Uh, I was uh, <clears throat> wondering what other kind of threads you might be picking up on in the earlier uh, and more immediate, well, the earlier colonial history in North Africa, the well documented French obsession, I would say, on with in, in ethnographic practice of deciding who was really indigenous to North Africa and differentiating Arabs and Berbers, trying to document the sort of degrees of mixing and pure uh, Berber tribes, um, and then making political and policy decisions based on those kinds of ethnographic distinctions. Um, and then that's also resonating in lots of new and um, impactful ways in current politics in North Africa as well. So I, I'm wondering, you know, how you see the kinds of conversations you're looking at in France refracted in interesting ways, both in contemporary North Africa and then also in the colonial period historically. Thanks so much, Matt, and it's great to see you. Um, and thank you for that question or that that suggestion as well. Um, I, I tried to, I, I realized, again, I realized that I, I needed to provide this greater frame, right, to, uh, to, to basically talk about anti-racism in the context of nativism and to try to provide a colonial genealogy of nativism. Um, and so I tried to gesture to this a little bit in the introduction, uh, but but again, this is a, kind of where I need to go uh, next um, as well. Uh, so in going much further back, but also um, to 19th century Algeria, right, and, uh, and as I mentioned briefly in the book, um, the, the the Indian Wars were an actual model for what the uh, what the French army was doing in in Algeria from 1830. Uh, they were actually looking to the the very wars that were happening at the same time for the conquest of the West in the U.S. and saying, well, either we should not do this or we should do it. Um, and so there, uh, certainly, uh, to kind of um, come back to that the colonial, almost immediately legal definition of the indigenous, right? Because it's it's almost immediately codified uh, in sort of in in writing, right, in in, in documents. Uh, the, of course, the other terms that are being used are les Arabes, 
um, les musulmans to an extent, but there's immediately, of course, they realize that there aren't only Arabs and there aren't only Muslims and in the definition of what those groups are, right? So, so this is very much part of that colonial kind of legal classification of the indigenous populations, as you say, exactly, and not just in Algeria, really in any colonial field. We know the importance of anthropology um, as, a, as the kind of cultural arm of, of, the, of, the, of the various military expeditions. So this is absolutely important in terms of, um, you know, again, to, to gesture to Mamdani's argument on the politicization of indigeneity in the post-colonial nation state, I think this is extremely relevant. It's not the focus of my work right now, uh, because I'm because I'm focused on, unfortunately, I'm focused on French nativism. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think that there is, that one could go much further, and this is, again, looping back to, to Cécile's original point, in, um, in really problematizing the naturalization right of uh precisely of colonial legal identities which which have become as we know the grounds for post-colonial you know uh, identities and and identified in, in various different forms so i take your point uh and i think that there's there's a lot of work to be done there um and so it it would be it would be good to be in conversation with the with the work that is being done uh, there, but but perhaps also, in fact, and maybe this is what you're suggesting. This can also I can also kind of try to pitch that uh, the importance of that work uh, in terms also of um, the global South and you know and in terms of Palestine Israel and right so that the the stakes are extremely high in a way everywhere for the aftermath right of um, of the colonial production of <laughs> indigeneity in a kind of you know perverse sense. We have time for, I think, just one more question. I want to leave it for the audience if anybody wants to snag it. Otherwise, I'm happy to selfishly take it. OK, so Olivia, I'm going to ask you the question that keeps me up at night, because like I said, I'm being selfish right now. Um, it's one that I have been thinking about so much with your book. I think a lot of the analogies between our work, thinking about you know these movements to co-opt and erase the past and distort it, use it in the service of power. And what keeps me up at night is thinking about solidarity politics. And so thinking about your book specifically, and what you observed, you know, through this long trajectory, what do you see as, you know, some of the, I guess, hopes, maybe the limits of a solidarity politics thinking about here? I mean, there's so much potential in transcolonial thing, thinking about a transnational solidarity politics, but clearly we see the limits as well. So I guess that's just a very broad and loose question to, to kind of give you the final word of like a where do we go from here? I, I love that you're asking this question precisely as the final question, because I think it's also important to be future oriented. And I know we have very little time, but I think the maybe the one thing I would leave you with is, is the importance of um, of what, of what Jacques Rancière calls the cause of the other. So advocating for a cause that is not your own. Um, and I think that that's, that's kind of the, the if, if I see a through line in the work um, from the first book to this book, it's that it's, it's precisely trying to disrupt um, a kind of self, you know, self-oriented cause, right? To disrupt this idea of identity um, in in the in the transcolonial, as uh, and Abdelady pointed out, the transcolonial identification. So identification with the cause of another. That's not actually my cause, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid we are at time. Uh, this went by very very fast. First of all, congratulations, Olivia, on your book. Um, and many, many thanks to Cecile Aldui and Abdelali Hajad for uh, accepting Olivia's invitation to discuss it. Uh, thank you to Hajj for moderating. Thank you all for coming. Um, we have uh, 10 more book chats this academic year, and I hope you will join us as we celebrate other uh, publications by colleagues at USC. Our next one is on November 14, when we will be talking about Greg Talman's uh, Theocritus, Space, Absence, and Desire. Thank you all, and congratulations, Olivia. Thank you so much. Olivia. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye.